Hello, and welcome to the debut of The Newman Show. Uh, we're having some technical difficulties with Facebook, so if you see us on the phone, it's just trying to share it because we couldn't do it beforehand. But anyway, my guest tonight is going to be Michelle Eskenazi. Yes. I said it right. Uh, who is the co-founder, the founder, the owner of Empire? The founder. The founder of Empire Bail Bonds. Mm -hmm. And our topic tonight is going to be bail reform. But before we get into that, because this is the first night of the show, I want to give you an idea of what you're in for. Unlike Pin Up School Cats and Comics, this is not going to be an entertainment-driven show. It's going to be more of a topic-driven show, as tonight being bail reform. Not all topics will be serious. Not all will be political. There will be entertainment, and there still will be pinups and comics and everything else on. Our goal is to try to have Teresa on once a month, if she could do it, and have the entertainment format, and we'll take it from there. So... This is what you're going to be in for, pretty much. You'll, you'll get a real taste of it tonight, because we're, we're coming out swinging with, the, with tonight's topic. Uh, bail reform is very important, and unfortunately, most people don't know about it. Right, it's true. And we're, we're going to tell you what it is tonight and how it's going to affect you, because believe me, it will affect you. That's true, too. So just before we get into things, I want to plug some stuff. Next Wednesday, the 15th, I'm going to be doing comedy at the Greenwich Village Comedy Club. So if you can, come on down. I don't have the times and everything yet, so just check out my Facebook page and I'll post it. I'm waiting for that. And then the following week, uh, I'm going to be at the Irish Pub. We're having another comedy night there. I want to give a shout out to the guys in the Irish Pub if they're watching. It's a dark night tonight. So. Where is the Irish Pub? The Irish Pub is in Baldwin on Merrick Road. Okay. It's right near the precinct, okay. the first precinct. So don't drink and drop out of there. Or she'll get you, then I'll get you. Right. But, or I'll get you, then you'll get them. Likely. So, yeah, that's basically what you're in for. So before we get into the topic, I, I just want to give a shout-out. You see I have a new logo. That's thanks to Fred Watkins. Uh, he does graphic design. His business name is Voodoo Hound Graphic Art and Design. Look him up. Uh, he helped me out a lot, spent a lot of time on the phone working out different projects with me. This is just one of many things I'm going to have. I'm going to have some video-type stuff as well. So we're definitely getting there. Uh, so let's get into the sponsors. I want to start with Kayla Logistics, my cousin Frank Zambudo. Kayla Logistics, where your business is our priority. Our goal is to provide our customers with end-to-end -end logistics solutions worldwide. Contact Frank Zambudo regarding all of your international import and export needs. Frank also has domestic contracts with many of the largest coast-to-coast -coast trucking companies in the USA for non-personal cargo. For Newman Show listeners, just mention the Newman Show, and Frank will take 10% off your first domestic trucking shipment in the USA. Frank Zambito and Kay Logistics, where your business is our priority. And you can reach Frank direct at 347-536-3933, or email at frank at kaylogistics.com. Frank is very knowledgeable in his business, so definitely give him a call. He knows about the tariffs and the daily change that goes on. He's on top of everything, so definitely give him a ring, and he can help you out. And also... Day 3 Botanicals. <clears throat> Day 3 Botanicals is offering Newman Show listeners 20% off all CBD products. Have it your way. The Day 3 six-time full-spectrum CBD formula is available completely THC-free. It's the perfect high-performance CBD product for those who are subject to drug testing at work. Day 3 also offers a six-time and regular-strength full-spectrum CBD oils with trace amounts of THC as allowed by law in all 50 states by law under the nation's new 2018 Agricultural Farm Act. All Day 3 products come with a 30-day money-back satisfaction guarantee. Take a look at Day 3's new CBD PEP formula that's available now, and they have a new massage oil that's coming soon. You can order the massage oil now to be one of the first for delivery, and I'm definitely looking forward to that. Visit Day3Botanicals.com, and for those who are just listening and not watching, 3 is spelled out T-H-R-E-E. -E. And listeners, remember to use Newman20 code at checkout to receive 20% off on your order. Don't accept cheap foreign isolates. Day 3 products are a full-spectrum hemp, are full-spectrum hemp extracts that are organically grown in Colorado, non-GMO, and free from any chemical additives. Insist on Day 3 CBD for your health. And I can tell you that CBD oil, uh, there's a lot of different ones out there. There's a lot of watered-down, crappy foreign versions of it. This is top-of-the-line, really good stuff. And if you get the, the six-time one, believe me, you'll know within 10, 15 minutes if it's working. And cool. that's our sponsor. So now we're going to get into the show. Uh, so bail reform, a lot of people don't know what it is. The way they're trying to sell it to people, bail reform is helping people because they're... 
they're taking people when they commit crimes or allegedly commit crimes, they have to spend time in jail, and that's wrong. They need to be out on the streets, apparently. And they use the excuse that, well, people can't afford bail, so just let, open the doors and let them out. They try to tell you it's for nonviolent criminals right. only. That's right. That's right. But the truth is that's not really what's happening in other states, and it's going to get really bad here. And the reason why I have Michelle on is because she's not just someone who thinks she knows about it. She does know about it. She lives it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background before we actually get into bail reform. Okay. Um, well, I started in the bail bond business about 25 years ago, and uh, I founded a company by the name of Empire Bail Bonds. Um, in 2007, I also founded the New York State Bail Bondsman Association. We're a not-for-profit. I'm currently the president of the state association, and we go up to Albany. Uh, we created the association to keep the integrity and the professionalism in our industry and to you know, keep ahead of any legislative changes and things like that. So since 2013, I've been going back and forth to Albany about bail reform. We've been able to hold it off since then, but um, as many know, in the state of New York, um, in November, the Democratic Party uh, took over in Albany, and um, I had a feeling that there were going to be some major changes as it related to uh, law enforcement and public safety, and uh, I was right. Yes. Now, a lot of people think that, well, first of all, a lot of people don't even know what bail reform is, right. but other people that do, they think it's a good thing. Right. Uh, tell what it really is, not not what they're f the fluff that trying to make it seem. Tell what the real impact of bail reform is going to be come January. It's very multi-layered, you know what I'm saying? So anytime you hear the word reform, as a human, you automatically think that, oh, something must be wrong with it. If they're reforming it, something's got to be wrong with it. But for example, Governor Cuomo, when he did a State of the State speech this year in January, stood up and said, "We, uh, New York State has the most progressive bail statute in the nation. And we actually do, because you know this as a correction officer, when somebody gets arrested in the state of New York, they see a judge within 24 hours, they're arraigned at their hospital bedside, even if they're the one that caused the accident. So we move the court essentially to a hospital bedside. So New York is a very fair state as it pertains to arraignment. And bail has always been uh, at the judge's discretion. So the prosecutor could have asked for a half a million dollars. The defense attorney could turn around and say, listen, judge, my guy's the best guy since sliced bread in America. And the judge would have said, oh, all right, $20,000 is the bail. Bail reform indicated when it started off the rhetoric. I think that's what you're thinking about. The rhetoric indicated that people were lang this is their rhetoric, it's branded rhetoric. People are languishing in cages because they're poor and they can't afford bail. And they use the Khalif Browder story as kind of like their Bible for the whole movement of bail reform. Khalif Browder was a young kid who had a criminal background, who was charged with a robbery in New York City, and he, he also was on probation. The judge violated him on probation. On the new case, he was held on a $3,000 bail, but he couldn't get out because he had a probation hold. So legal aid failed him. They didn't hear his case for two and a half years, and he hung himself. So they blamed the bail industry, and they packaged it up. They spent about $9 billion a quarter on PR and all this other stuff. They're very, very extremely well-funded, like Soros-style mm. funded. Not surprisingly. Yeah. They got like nine billion not-for-profits that go up to Albany and to every state and advocate for the indigent. Um, and uh, that's how they packaged bail reform. But that's not what actually ended up happening. That's a completely different situation what ended yeah, that, up happening. Yeah, that's a one of. And I, I mean, I think they've been proving how bad this is going to be all in all because, first of all, what was it? The Kennedy Foundation w was a nonprofit organization that were bailing people out that couldn't afford bail. And their poster child, what was the story behind that? He, he, um... Yeah. So the RFK Foundation, uh, I forgot what her first name is, but she used to be married to Governor Cuomo. Um, so she's got like, you know, 
a lot like a, I don't know, a billion dollars philanthropic money to spend on like whatever she wants. She decided that they were going to go in and go to Rikers Island and bail everybody out without knowing who they are, $50,000 bail, $100,000 bail. And when they came off Rikers Island, there was cake, there was balloons, there was big welcome home signs. Um, you know, in the criminal justice system, we don't really kind of do that. Right. But that's what they did. They thought that, <clears throat> that was very important. And the guy that they got out, that there was their poster child, a couple of days after that, he went and robbed the church. And then a couple, of, another one that they got out, a couple of days after that, went and raped somebody. Half of them didn't show up for court. They kind of got out of the bail business as quickly as they went yeah. in. They were like, oh, wait I don't a know minute. I was from that foundation, but I know a guy that got out. Uh, it was some domestic charge, and he went and he ended up killing his girlfriend or his right. wife or whoever it was. So right. these are not good people they're putting out on the streets. Right. Well, you know, the thing about bail that works so successfully and has always worked historically so successfully in New York and in all the states in the United States is that bail, who gets out on bail is usually decided, was decided by mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle. So in our industry, we refer to that as the circle of love. So let's say for example, little Johnny is addicted to heroin. And now he's burglarized the neighbor's house for the third time in three months, which happens all the time on Long Island with the opioid epidemic, right? So now the parents, they say, you know what, Fungal, we're not getting him out of jail. He's got to stay in jail because at least we know, A, he'll be alive, B, he'll detox for the first 72, and then maybe C, we can get him a bed somewhere. Bail reform takes all of us as parents, as humans, uh, out of the equation and puts it into the hands of a government format. So basically it's government taking over industry and right. making the decision. And we all know how well the government deciding is, which, which boggles my mind how people want to put more and more faith in the government that they have no faith in to begin with. They, they don't like anything they do. There's a lot of anti-Trumpers out there right now that want the government to decide who goes to jail, who doesn't go to jail, who gets benefits, who doesn't get benefits. I mean, if you don't trust the government we have, why would you give them more power? Power should be in the hands of the people and the voters. But unfortunately, and, and what I've noticed, and, and in the information society we're in now and how easy it is to find stuff out, people, I think, are less educated on who's running and why. It's always been an issue, and Jay Leno's done jokes on it, Howard Stern has done jokes on it, where they went out and they interviewed people, asked them who they were voting for, they gave them the opposite party's platform. Oh, you show you for this, this, and this, and of course they agreed, because they don't know. They just know Democrat, Republican, they don't know any of the real issues, and this is not everybody. Some people are educated, but unfortunately the masses seem to be uneducated in this. They're just told how to think. And the news does a very good job of spinning. Yeah, well. And they do make you think that bail is racist or, you know, just for the rich. Now, if you don't understand, explain exactly how the bail system works. It's it's not... At current? Or just what, what it was developed for. Because bail wasn't like, hey, you committed murder, you're getting a $1,000 bail. No. It, it didn't work like that. So explain the actual bail process, how... How somebody would get bailed out and why, how it's determined. Again, it is a judge's discretion, but there's somewhat of a formula for it. Um, well, like the way it exists now, and I'll just talk about New York because right. I think you know that's where we are. Right. right, makes more sense. So, in the state of New York, for example, when someone is arrested and they see the judge within 24 hours of their arrest at current this, and now we're talking about prior to bail reform, because bail reform, my friends, is going to be enacted on New Year's Day. So our lives will completely change post 1120. But as it exists and has existed since essentially the beginning of time in the state of New York, is you're arrested, you're arraigned within 24 hours, you see a judge, um, the judge takes a look at your rap sheet, and the, and the prosecutor asks for a certain amount of bail, defense attorney argues for you, and then the judge determines what the bail amount is. Let's just say that little Johnny gets a $5,000 bond in the state of New York. That premium, which is a fancy word for the fee for a bail bond, 
would be $460. It's like a weird sliding scale. People always think it's 10%. But like on a $50,000 bond in New York, it's $3,260. Okay. I just, I, I thought it was 10%. Yeah, it's so. not. In other states it is, but in New York it's a very low premium. People think it's much higher. It's not. So anyway, for that $5,000 bond, which is more like a regular sort of bond amount, 50000 is pretty high felony, you know, offenses. But let's say it was a $5,000 bond, it's $460 for the fee, and then usually mom and dad have to put up some sort of collateral. If they don't, on these smaller bonds, they usually put up like 10% of the bond amount, and then they, if little Johnny shows up for court at the end of the case, they get that back. So essentially, they have to put up $960, and then at the end of the case, they would get back $500, assuming that he goes to court. And then we track that individual until the final disposition of the case. So, for example, at Empire, when one, one of the guys gets out, then within 24 hours he has to come into our office, we take a picture of him, he signs off on his jurisdictional paperwork, and then he, we're open seven days a week, he has to come in once a week, he signs his name, prints his name, puts his next court date in the pot, and we're in touch with mom and dad. Mom and dad own the bail bond like they own any other insurance policy, That because that's what it is. It's right. an insurance policy. So if during the pendency of the case, the kid is, I don't know, wreaking havoc at home or making flight plans to go to the Dominican Republic or something like that, they can call, they can come in, they sign a document, they pull off the bond. They re, it's called revoking the bond. So then we, we take the individual and we bring them back to, in, in Nassau County, bring them back to the Nassau County Jail, and then the next day they see the judge, and then they're rearranged, and then bail is reset. So how does bail protect the public safety? Because the family is involved. The family has skin in the game. Right. Everybody is looking out for little Johnny, not just the government of the state of New York. Everybody's really connected to this individual's liberty. So what happens is that the defendant will 95% of the time show up for court, and 95% of the time take the case to final disposition. Now, does that stop recidivism? Not, not always, but a lot of the times it does because it keeps the situation fresh and new for like a lot of these younger offenders. Like they feel like, oh my God, I got out in December of 18, here's my case in December of 20, and I'm still checking into the bail bond office, right? So I never want to do this again. I don't really right. like that red Because it's an lady. inconvenience because it's supposed to be. Right. It's not supposed to be <clears throat> like Christmas morning. Right. Right. You're not getting rewarded for committing the crime. Right. Or allegedly committing the, committing the crime. Because again, if if you're if you if you're bailed out if you're in jail you haven't been convicted yet, but it's an incentive to show up for court basically and, and which prior to bail reform was up to your honor. Right. But what the legislators did in Albany and the people in Long Island don't know this is not only did they go in the back room and do bail reform, they went in the back room and did judge reform, law enforcement reform district attorney reform and bail reform, all in one bill. So come 1120, judges can't decide who gets out of jail. They're mandated to release. Every single misdemeanor and every single nonviolent felony is subject to mandatory release. Every cop that passes a guy that just committed a misdemeanor, which is, let's say, shoplifting at Roosevelt Field, or, for example, a nonviolent felony is rape three, okay? Um, a misdemeanor is desecrating a cemetery. I always say when I went to Albany, like, isn't it, if you're a Democrat and you're a Republican, isn't it equally as insulting to you that your grandmother's grave was desecrated and equally as insulting to you? Because that's not, it defies political ideology. Crime of moral turpitude defies political ideology. Right. So now the cops can no longer arrest those individuals. They took away cops' arrest powers. So no longer in the state of New York, come 1120, will police be able to arrest anyone that commits a misdemeanor or a nonviolent felony. They will only be given a ticket. And it started, and the excuse they used was marijuana smokers. Uh, people just smoking pot, leave them alone. Give them a ticket. It's not the most. It's not the worst thing. The jails are full of pot smokers. 
They're not, at least not out here. I mean, maybe in some areas it's strict, but unless you're you're a serious dealer, people aren't in jail for smoking pot. They're really no. not. It's it might be an added charge to something. Right. If you have, but it I don't know anybody in the jail that's there specifically for having pot and smoking it. Right. So they they do it for that because it's a it's a thing. It's a controversial topic that a lot of people think it should be legalized, not only for medicinal use but for recreational use. And people do have an argument there because they compare it to alcohol. The deaths and violence caused by alcohol as opposed to marijuana. Alcohol is illegal. Marijuana is not. So fine. They get people on their side that way. But again, it's not just. You know, it's not just the pot smokers that are getting released. It's everybody. I saw in some states that somebody who had child porn on his computer oh, yeah. was let go because it's a nonviolent crime because he just was in, in possession of porn. He didn't actually do anything to a child. But it's a nonviolent crime. So this guy's not getting in trouble for it. Right. It, what's, uh, what's the next step? Because, again, if, if the whole point of the jail system and the prison system is to get people to pay for their crime. It's not just rehabilitation because, again, if someone's sentenced to life, you're not rehabilitating them. You don't care about rehabilitating them. If someone's uh, sentenced to the death penalty, it's not about rehabilitating them. So people are confused thinking that jail's just about rehabilitating people. It's not. And, again, there's a lot of people in there that don't belong there, that made a stupid mistake. You want them to learn a lesson and move on. Mm hmm not get rewarded for or not even in trouble for committing these crimes because next time when that guy's raping an eight-year-old now they're going to say well, where are the cops how come they didn't bust this guy they had him they let him go no they, they didn't have him because they're not allowed to have him anymore right and this is what people don't realize uh there was a guy in there and i'm not speaking of anything that wasn't in the newspaper so you know i'm not violating anything here but there was a guy who was arrested for um, attempting to solicit sex from minors yeah that's luring a child but they said no they because they said no he didn't have to register as a sex offender mm -hmm. and he initially had half a million dollar bail mm. that's big you know that mm -hmm. if you if you got half a million dollar bail in new york that's a big deal I but think the, I guy, know the end of this story. the guy had cancer yeah oh yeah they released the guy so they ROR'd him which means Judge released Murphy. on his own recognizance because it was too expensive mm -hmm. to pay for his care now he is a guy who's attempted what was that his third or fourth time yep it was multiple times he did it so he mm -hmm. he's dying now you don't let this guy out. What's his incentive not to commit the crime again? So what does he do? Does it does something else again? They, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but I know they put him on house arrest. Right. Oh. And then he, he started uh, trying to molest or sent pics to um, the home mm. health aide that was coming to see him. And guess what? He's back in jail again. So mm. now all these people that that got attacked after the fact, mm. the other kids he went after and that girl, wouldn't have been if they left this guy in jail. So who were they helping? I'll tell you who they're not helping, Dennis, and who absolutely was not a part of any of the conversations in Albany, crime victims. Right. Um, that was one of my biggest conversations with senators and assembly people, is you are not only omitting crime victims, you're creating a whole new pool of crime victims. Right. And the thing that's kind of sad is that the women here on Long Island a lot of them are fortunate enough to be stay-at-home moms because they have 2.3 children and husbands right. going to work every day and they're living a little tiny slice of the American dream, hopefully, right? That's why we all came out to Long Island was to get that tiny little slice. And they have no clue. They're walking around. They have no clue. If you take one of these issues that we're talking about here, bail reform, and you put it into a, a Long Island moms group, they have a heart attack. They don't want to talk. They want to pretend as if, oh, no, 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 that's only happening in New York City. Well, I got news for all of you. That's not just happening in New York City. That is about to be the new normal. Yeah. Here in Long Island, that is about to be our new normal. So what do I say to all the people that say, Michelle, you know so much about criminal justice. You know so much about bail, blah, 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 blah. You know what I say? Teach your kids how to use pepper spray. Instead of putting a helmet on them when they're going skateboarding, give them pepper spray. And, and let them learn a martial art, like a real yep. one, like a crop of God or something like that. Make sure your daughters well have tasers. You know, like, I'm not even kidding. It's about to go batshit crazy. It, it really will. And, and they're touting how low crime is in New York. And we all know, well, we all know that's not a, an accurate description of what reality is. It's... Just because people aren't getting arrested and convicted for crimes doesn't mean they're not happening. And before bail reform, and I know you used to post it on the regular, 
used to show the difference of before and after. I got in a lot of trouble the, for that. The initial bail. <laughs> yeah. And I had people attack me. If you remember, one guy commented, he goes, oh, you, how do you know that's true? Because you're posting. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's actual fact. Yeah, I got in trouble. Somebody would get arrested, and, and when they went to court or whatever, they would get, let's just say, a $20,000 yeah. bail. Mm-hmm. Then the appeal, next thing you know, it's 500 or something ridiculously low. Right. And some of them were that extreme. Right. And some of the crimes were severe. Right. Possession of a weapon, attempted whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can speak on the, the crimes more specifically. Mm -hmm. But these were violent crimes mm -hmm. that basically were just saying, hey, you got a couple hundred bucks? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So what happens in Nassau County, for example, is when you get arrested, you get arraigned in, in uh, Raymond A. in district court. And then the judge sets some sort of bail. Let's say in your case it was $20,000. Three days later, you always go to part nine. It's a transitional part that we have. And then if you don't make bail, usually the judge in part nine will go, oh, okay. You know, and, that, and we noticed, me and the Department of Corrections started noticing, wait a minute, they, they were, bail was set three days ago, and now three days later they didn't make bail, and now they're being released. So it started to become epidemic. Right. So I started sharing and it. And were violent crimes. And a lot of them were violent crimes. A lot of them. And one of the most kind of like appalling uh, nonviolent crimes that, you know, probably Long Island people don't know about is selling drugs on school property. That's a nonviolent crime. Vehicular homicide. That crime that happened out in Suffolk County with the limo driver right. that killed all those young girls and whatnot, that's a nonviolent crime. So nonviolent doesn't mean non-victim. But all of those crimes are going to be released. Now, here's the thing. We are, the Senate session closes June 16th. So we, as an association, along with the Nassau County Sheriff's Department, along with the, the Sergeant's Benevolent Association in, in the city, along with a couple of law enforcement unions, Suffolk County, um, we are trying to get a few amendments passed before it rolls out on 1120. Because some of the senators that actually even signed on to it now look at it and go, oh, I think we were duped here a little bit. And this line three, we didn't know that this was going to be this because what happened was the governor is a pretty savvy guy. Yeah. So they have this thing that he does on the night of the budget. It's called an omnibus bill. Omnibus means like this huge bill, right? And in like political language, they call it the big ugly. So the governor goes, hey, you want new roads? Hey, you don't want that property tax? This is what I want. So you sign this. Everything in the kitchen sink is in here, but I'll give you that. So that's what they did. Right. But they didn't really realize what was in there. So right now we're trying to get a few amendments to protect the public safety of the people of the state of New York. Even the biggest drug dealers, which are A, a felony weight drug dealers, those are drug traffickers. Those are big drug traffickers. There's a, we have a special narcotics district attorney in New York. Her name is Bridget Brennan. She's having a heart attack. She can't, because what they use bail for, district attorneys use bail as leverage, right? They got a guy in, he's a big drug trafficker, he's from another country or whatever, bringing fentanyl and all kinds of crazy crap here. They say, it's a million dollar bail, and now he's in for 72 hours. Well, the district attorneys say to him, you know what? If you don't tell me who's supplying the drugs, there's no way we're lowering your bail. And you see it when you watch Law & Order, like people yeah. watch shows like that. But they really do, prosecutors historically, have been able to use bail as kind of a negotiation. Leverage. Right, leverage. They're not, they're not going to be able to do that. So it's going to be um, jungle-like. And if you don't think drugs are a problem, you haven't been paying attention to what's going on, especially with heroin. Right. Right. You, you really haven't. It's it, it's sad that that it's really coming to this. And again, just to reinforce it, if someone did have the million dollar bail, right, and they took off, mm -hmm. a few things are going to happen. One, the family who signed for it is responsible for it. That's true. So they're going to want this person back. So they're looking for him. The police are going to be looking for him because they took off. And you guys are going to be looking for him. You're going to send the bounty hunters out there because you lost your money. 
So it's not just uh, cops looking for someone, especially if the guy leaves out of the state and like, well, it's not much we could do. Hopefully he gets picked up for a crime somewhere else. you got a lot of different avenues looking for this person. The odds of him getting caught and coming back That's true. are much better than if there's no bail at all. That's actual. So if you do get that serious drug charge or the child porn charge or something that you know you're going to be going away for a long time, why would you stay? No, I, um, Why wouldn't you take off? Dennis, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. Because these child predator guys, they're sick, sick puppies, right? And they move because their home base is usually a laptop, right? right? So they could take that with them pretty much to any Motel 6, right? So they're like moving and shaking and moving. They're moving all over the place. They are higher risk people than your drug dealer from Roosevelt. Yeah. They're higher risk, you know? So it is true what you're saying, and then what ends up happening is you're with the new system, the way it's going to be rolled out, is when those people fail to appear, and for example, in the state of New Jersey, the failure to appear rate, I think, is at 83%, okay? When those people fail to appear, nobody goes to look for them. There's no such thing as a misdemeanor warrant squad. There's no funding for right. that in, in New York. So what happens is these people just don't show up for court, and how they get caught is when they commit a new crime, right? The cops will run them, and they'll be like, oh, you have a warrant. It's not because somebody's going out and looking for them. It's because they're going to commit new crime and they got caught. Now, now again, is that a loophole? Let's say they, they do take off. It's a nonviolent crime, and they get picked up for another nonviolent crime. Are they getting locked up? No. No, no they're still going to be out, right? They're still going to so be out. So it's even more incentive for them to, to take off. They Listen, the, the criminal offenders, to them, this is like the, this is Christmas morning. Every single day subsequent to 1120 for them is going to be Christmas morning. And again, if you don't think this is going to increase crime around here, you're, you're sadly mistaken. You, and you may not know about it because, again, these aren't people that are going to be getting arrested. So No, they're not. And, you know, the thing about it. Until it actually happens to you particularly, you know, people aren't going to know. When there was a couple of years ago, they decriminalized the 155.25, which is shoplifting, at Roosevelt Field. So up to $1,000, you don't get arrested anymore if you go. In our language, they call it boosting you know, when you steal from, you know, wherever. So that day that they did that at Roosevelt Field, my boosting population knew about it. They, they went up to Roosevelt Field. They knew all about it. They knew that they could steal $999 worth of stuff. And walk. And walk. So what do you think they all, they all went up there as groups to steal? You know, and that's unfortunately, like burglary, pushing burglaries, they're all nonviolent crimes. So where do you think these people are going to come from? If the guys from the Bronx and Brooklyn, and they know where the nice houses are. The nice houses are on Long Island. So you have to really kind of, if you can, buy like a pistol grip shotgun or something before, you know, like yeah. make sure you're ready in your house. And, and it really, it, it makes you wonder because be, besides letting people out, uh, they're just, they're, the hug-a-thug mentality is just through the roof now. And you talked about the welcome home thing with the bail. Remember they, how, what they wanted to do for the gangbangers in the city? They held pizza parties for them. It's, it's... I mean, this is ridiculous. Now they're going to be getting free calls. Mm, free, they, they already have them. Uh, did they start it already? They started Okay, free so calls. it did start the free calls. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, again, if you're an inmate advocate and, and you want to, you felt they were getting ripped off by the phone cards, that's one thing. Then, then do a prepaid calling card deal. Have it where it's a reasonable price. I have no problem with that, you know. I don't think anybody really has a problem with that. But just to give them a free call. So now they can be on the phone all day. They can be calling out hits and doing whatever they want because it's hard enough to monitor them now. Now give them basically 12-hour access to a phone with no fees. They're going to be calling all day. You cannot possibly go through that many hours of, of phone calls. And, know, and they know that. It's, it's unfortunate, you know. My heart, as it pertains to law enforcement and blue, my deepest heart is always with corrections. Because as a kid, you know, because of what I do and coming yeah. up, you know, to where I am now, I always started off with correction officers. Those were my people, right? So I feel like 
not not just every brand of blue got screwed with bail reform, but correction officers mostly. Like there's just no respect for correction officers That's and the job true. that they do. And, and the problem is because they try to run the jail like a business. The police department they kind of can because they issue tickets. Tickets generate revenue. There's nothing in the jail that really generates revenue. It's not fully true. If they if they take the federal inmates, the feds give right. them certain money, right, but right. They, they they don't even do that really much anymore. Right. That, so I don't understand why. That's true. But the jail is not meant to be a business. It's meant to protect. It's meant to keep people safe. Cops do a great job of, of arresting the people, but if you're not gonna if you're not gonna keep them away from the public, what's the point of arresting them? And, and I know that part of the issue, I, and you get to see more and more of it. They wanted to stop the window breaker laws in the city. And the window breaker laws are basically what we're saying: the minor turnstile jumping, smoking pot, this, that, and the other thing. Ask a cop in the city how many people were busted with guns. They caught murderers. Oh, they sure. caught a lot of people yeah. with these window breaker laws. Right. I mean, even if you look at like Al Capone, a lot of these guys were caught with a busted tail or something right. like that. It's not the crimes they commit. Well, he, he was actually tax evasion, but they get a lot of big people from, from blowing a stop sign or a stupid thing. Sure. But now you're, you're, you're handcuffing the police and saying, right. well, you, no, you got to let these criminals go. When did it switch that the criminals were the good guys and, and the cops and the law enforcement were the bad guys? It, 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 it definitely changed, and you see it in the paper, you see it on the news, and you see it now in, in, in laws that are getting passed down. Well, in New York, it changed in November. I don't know. I, I, I think that was another step, but I think it's been going for quite some oh, time. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's been like a, a gradual progression, but permanently, when it became, you know, when the election came through, it, it I knew like there were going to be major changes for the good people, the law-abiding people of the state of New York. And that's who my main concern is. Everybody's always like, well, you're just concerned about your business and you're just concerned about your bottom line. Well, here's the thing, boys and girls. Don't worry about me. I'm good. I'll, I'll be golden. I, I had jobs you know, before corrections, and if need be, I'll have jobs after corrections. Yeah, but it's, that's it, not it, the it's issue. not why. And I, I, I didn't take it for the money either. That's another thing. They think right. we're overpaid. Um, find another profession that, that does what we do well, when I started, it was 30 grand. I think it's up to 34 or 35 now as a starting salary. Um, the top is under 100. Yes, when they show in the paper, they show all these people making a lot of money. But they, what they don't show is some of them are retiring and cashing out unused time, which most union jobs have. Right. Another thing is the people that are making top salaries, like they show, are giving up everything. They're giving up nights. They're giving up weekends. They're giving up time with their family. They work constantly. Because we're understaffed. We're not overcrowded. And that's another lie. That's, they blatantly tell a lie. It's a big lie. The jail's overcrowded. We're not even at half capacity right now. That's true. That's true. Now, granted, they may have shut down half the jail, but that was, again, their option of not maintaining it and just closing it and, and ripping it apart. We've been understaffed for quite some time. And, and now if they just open up the doors and let half of the half out, we're going to be overstaffed and they're going to lay off. And then what's going to happen when this big crime influx comes in there's not going to be anyone to work there. And who's going to want the job? I, I don't know, because it's it's similar right now with cops, because I have a lot of, you know, I have a, most of my friends are in law enforcement in one capacity or another, and like the cops in the city, they're moved, they completely have moved away from quality of life crime. Right. Because what they want to do is they want to go and do their tour, and they want to go home. They want to get home to their families alive, right. unindicted, not sued, you know, because the what they're what they're doing is they're going well. He's selling, you know what? If I arrest that guy, he's going to be out in an hour, two hours anyway. And you if know, he what, fights me you know, or whatever else, me. I'm the one who's going to get right, trouble. Right, right. And now they have well, you know what? I'm just going to go to the next corner. And you know yeah. what? Tomorrow I'll go to the next corner. And that's also cyclic. I mean, that's what's happening all over the United States. So when they say crime is down, mm mm no. mm mm mm. That's a crock. Yeah. You know, that's that's really not true. So what happens is nonviolent crime, like, for example, is um, possession of narcotics. Where And then nonviolent crime is burglary. Where do you think these zombies that are walking around Long Island, because there, there's tons of them, because I bail them out, I know who they are, um, where do you think they're getting their money for drugs? From your house. Yeah. They're going and taking your stuff. You know, they're not working the nine to five. They're not job. working nine to five, and you know, and 
the fact of the matter is all these crimes are nonviolent crimes and they're nonviolent felonies and people think well if they're nonviolent they're probably just not that bad you know it's not that big of a deal but when it's your family member or somebody that you love it becomes a really big deal and, and when that burglary becomes a robbery because someone's actually home and that happened yesterday it, here in Long Island then what happens then when they kill that person and yet this is their 15th house break in the first thing they're gonna do is turn well why didn't the cops do anything about it why because they can't they're not allowed because you're elected politicians I'm not saying that you elected them or that you voted for them but they are elected politicians are making this decision that your safety is not worth as much as their money yeah so my new hashtag Dennis is gonna be don't blame blue yeah and of course they will they will. They, they will. always come. Oh, they're going to, you know, everybody hates the cops until they need them. I, I hate watching these videos because it says, you know, man beaten for broken taillight. It never is that. When you right. watch the video, the thing is the cop pulls somebody over for a broken taillight, right. asks him for ID. I don't need to show you nothing. Right. And, and now they're all the controversial, you know, right. confrontational and stuff like that. And then it turns into a big deal. Then somebody reaches for a gun. Then there's a shootout. I, I, I read a headline, and this is supposed to be a legitimate news source. I read a headline that said, a uh, cop freed after unloading 15 shots into a guy. But what they didn't say is the guy was trying to run him down. And he was holding out the car and fighting for his life. And headlines are all that matters now. Most people, you know, there used to be integrity in, in, in press. Right, there isn't. The headline was direct representation of what the story was about. Right, right. And within the first paragraph, you knew the who, what, why, where, when. Right. And then it broke it down paragraph by paragraph. Now the headline sometimes has nothing to do with the story. Right. It's clickbait. Right. And in the first paragraph or three sometimes you don't even know what happened. Right. And how many people read past that? Everybody's in this ADD right. thing. They just like, see, right. You know, they want the instant gratification. If not, they're gone. So all they see is, uh, you know, unarmed man, right. nonviolent criminal, this, that, the other, you know, police brutality. But they never really look into the story. And it's funny because when they push them for these body cams. Right. Um, and what are you saying? Be careful what you wish for. So now these body cams came out, and they found out that a lot of times it wasn't the cops that were wrong. Now, I'm not saying all cops are right, because there's not one field in any job where everybody's 100% in the Right, like the Catholic Church. Are there bad Church. cops? Yes, there are bad cops. Right. But most of them turned out to be telling the truth. Right. Then they turned around, and they said body cams are racist. How could a body cam be racist? You're filming the exact uh, interaction between the officer and, and the suspect. Now, when they show these edited, and they are edited cell phone videos of a 30-second clip, of course people are going to make a judgment off that. And once you get that person convicted in the public eye, nothing yeah. matters. The truth doesn't yeah. matter anymore. And that happened with a cop that was returning fire. But the initial story was that an unarmed guy was shot. So they were all after this cop. And then they showed the video that he was shooting at the cop. But it didn't matter at that point. Unfortunately... Long Island's going to turn into the Bronx. Yeah. And that's exactly what's going to happen. I wish I wish I could move tomorrow. I really do. I, I mean, you know, and a lot of us are stuck here. You know, yeah. that's that's a big problem for a lot of us, you know. When we when I was going up to Albany and I was talking to these senators and assemblymen, you know, one of the things that I implored them and I kind of begged them was, "All right, like here's the thing. If you're going to do this, if you're hell bent on doing this, let's make a carve out for the indigent and let's make a carve out for recidivists." Because the indigent problem we felt as an association was an easy one to fix. Because they have, just like we, they have the indigent defense funds, they actually have bail funds, right? So we, we gave them a, um, like a checklist, right? So if you're living in a shelter, you're indigent. If you're on public, you know, so basically that the bail funds could have handled the indigent population that was the reason they were born to begin with that's who they're supposed to be handling right. and then the other carve out that we begged them for that we didn't get that you didn't get as new yorkers is the recidivist clause we said to them and i said to them i said so you're gonna give a mandatory release to the burglary guy the first time as a first time offender okay i understand that he's the first time offender but you're also going to, this, what you have written here, sir, says you're also going to give that to the third time offender. And you're also going to give the same mandatory release to the 15th time offender. So where is the deterrent to not continue 
to be a recidivist because just like you get up every day and do a job, and so do I, recidivism is their job. Right. That is their J-O-B. They get up every day, where am I going to get my drugs from? Where am I going to get my money from? Who am I going to rob today? I just can't even imagine of cops pulling up to a scene of a, of a house burglary or whatever because so the alarm goes off, and they're just writing the guy a ticket. Here you go, sir. You have to appear on Tuesday. And, and again, if you don't think that's going to piss you off, wait till it's your house that's robbed or burglarized. Right. And your neighbors call the cops, and all they're doing is giving these guys tickets and saying, see you later. Right. You're going to be pissed. I, but I, don't blame Blue because it's not their fault. That was They were legislated out in Albany. So, you know, it's, real, it's not the union's fault. It's not the actual cop's fault. It's no officer's fault. It all happened unbeknownst to them. And, and the funny thing is, the jails, I don't know about the prisons upstate and everything, but I can tell you that actually they're getting better too. It's not as much of a deterrent as it used to be. I, I, I know of certain prisons where they have TVs in the cell. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not a joke. It's, it's true. You can, you can look any of this up. If you had the money, you could get a TV put right in your cell mm -hmm. with cable. I, I mean, it's not a bad deal. Uh, they say solitary confinements, uh, you know, cruel and unusual punishment. But what do you do to the guy that even after you put him in jail is trying to kill people or do whatever? Give him pizza? Is that really your answer? Because that's what they're trying to do. Or just let them out, which is the, the other answer they're coming up with. You know, in New York, they have, you have to segregate these guys. You know, it's not really like solitary confinement like you see on the, on the movies. It's segregation. And you have the Bloods and you have the Crips. You can't keep them on the same tier. You can't keep them, you know, you know that. And you keep shutting down that. the jail. It gives you no choice. Right. You, you, well, the, the, the balance is trying to say, let's try to keep an even amount. Right. So they don't go after one they guy. They each other. You know. And it's still, it's, it's. I mean, I, I want to have Brian on here because I, I don't know how much he can actually say about the inside. I'd rather have him make the statements. Brian Sullivan's the president of the COBA of the National County Sheriff's Department. Knows Good a lot friend. about it. Yeah. And it's just getting more and more inmate friendly. Oh, yeah. And handcuffing us that we can't do our job properly. So, again, it's putting you at risk. It really is. Because mm -hmm. there are people in there that don't, they weren't afraid before a jail. Right. They're even less afraid now. They, now they might not even go. So what's stopping them from doing the crimes? And a lot of them, Dennis, unfortunately. And they're trying to take your guns away. Yeah. I don't think they're not. Right. The bullshit, and here's a curse, I knew right. it was coming sooner or yeah. later, of nobody's after your guns, they are after your guns. Right. They are. Look and what and look, doing at, in look, at, look at what some of them say, and look at these experts when they go out there showing you an AR-15 with a 30 um, magazine clip, clip that shoots 30 rounds in a second. They don't even know what they're talking about. There's no such thing as a 30 magazine round clip. Right. right. That right. doesn't even make sense. Uh, and, and what they're trying to do is disarm people they're trying to get you to hate cops mm -hmm. and sympathize with criminals. And then what that it's, it's going to be like Escape from New York soon. It, it really, really is. It, and, it, and again, I'm not joking about that. It's, it's a serious <laughs> issue that people don't understand. And by the time they do, it's going to be too late. too late. I bet you nobody in Venezuela thought 10, 15 years ago right. that they'd be in the situation where they are now. And it started with giving up their guns. That's right. Going, our government's great. Look at look at how great it is here. That's right. Uh, you know, screw America. Look at how hard they have it. We got it great here. Now what do they have? Now they're eating out of garbage cans. They're, they're getting run over and right. killed Escaping. in the streets. Right. For what? Right. For what? Because they disagree with the government? It's, it's really, I mean, I hate to sound like some sort of conspiracy theorist, but it really, really is true. If you take a look, if, uh, if you have some time, take a look at our Facebook page. It's the New York State Bail Bondsman Association pinned to the top of the page. You'll see a video that we did called Bail Reform the Purge. Okay, The Purge is a you series of movies. <laughs> it's true. And that I, might not be that far off. And you know what? We depict it. We did a version of it. We have like a quarter of a million views on this video. And really, it shows, it lists at the end, arson is a nonviolent crime. It lists all these crazy crimes that will be free release, essentially, come New Year's Day, which is going to be the gift to the uh, people of the state of New York. So congratulations on your victories in uh, the elections in November. That's it's what you got. And, and scary. Just so you know, to be fair, I don't lean one way or the other. I don't think either party represents me. But when one party starts putting me in danger, like actual danger more mm -hmm. than the other party, 
yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm that way too. I'm, I'm an especially a union person. Yeah. You know, the, typically Democrats and Are unions -union. went, went yeah. hand in hand. Right. This is the first time I saw all the unions unanimously vote against the Democratic candidate in Long Island, and she still won. Right. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a problem. There's dissension in the ranks. You, you see the parties are fighting with each other, and, and they're blaming Trump, but it has nothing to do with him because it's been going on for quite some time. It's just more open now, and, and you're seeing this. That's just when the Republicans were buttonheads, and we were oh, look at look at this, a joke. Democrats are fighting with each other, too. The liberals that, you know, you got your democracy ones and your socialist ones starting to fight now. And people don't realize either, we're not a democracy. Well, we weren't a democracy. We, would never be, we were never designed as a country to be a democracy. We were designed to be more of a republic. We were designed to be a nation of laws, right. not majority rules. Because majority rules doesn't even necessarily mean the most. If you look at the percentage of people that vote, it's not even the majority of the people that vote. It's true. So you're getting the majority of the minority of voters right. making decisions for the entire country. And now they want to even take more away by taking the Electoral College away. The voice of the people is already gone. And I think Abortion. that was very obvious. Not, not just that. If you looked at the primaries, a lot of people felt one vote, one person, one vote in the primaries. And you found out that wasn't even true. Uh, and it wasn't just Hillary that was doing it. Because Hillary was going to states with the superdelegates and winning before the elections even took place. Right. She was just doing whatever. And you saw people were doing that here, too. Um, I think it was Cruz was jumping out of the states and going after the delegates and, and starting to win states that there were no elections in yet, which means you didn't vote. The politicians voted for you, even though the majority disagreed. Mm -hmm. And if you don't see an issue with that, I, I don't know what to tell you because that's a big problem on both sides of it. This both bail sides. reform thing is going to be... It's unfortunate. It really, it's just so unfortunate because Long Island is such a great place. To, well, it was, it was such a great place was. to live. You know, a lot of people that live in Long Island are like me. They're from Brooklyn, you know, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And we came up Sunrise Highway for the American dream, right? right. We came to Cookie Steak Pub and the Sunrise Movie Theater, and we thought like we were in the promised land. And then we came up and settled here. And now I look at Long Island, and I'm like, Oh my God! What's gonna? It's gonna literally be Chicago 2.0. Yeah, that's what's gonna happen. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, so again, let them know how they can find you. Um, you can find me um, at New York State Bail Bondsman Association on Facebook. You could look me up at Michelle Eskenazi on Facebook or the Bail Bond Queen on Facebook. And thanks very much for coming on tonight and Always. educating people. Uh, we'll have to do this again because we didn't even get to the other stuff to eat too. Sure. But thanks a lot. Hope you'll enjoy the first Newman show. And again, check out uh, if you're into CBD oil, which you should be at this point. It's very helpful. You want to go to day three and check out Kayla Logistics. And we will see you next week. Good night, Long Island. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah.